Today we're going to talk about something controversial. Spice. No, this isn't Dune, and we're not going to talk about all of these spices. We're going to talk about just one. Because it turns out that nutmeg is the blood diamond of the spice world. Let's get some geography out of the way first. This is Indonesia. It's made up of over 17,000 islands right between the Indian and Pacific Oceans and is the largest island nation in the world. And here, in the Banda Sea, is a group of 11 small volcanic islands called, unsurprisingly, the Banda Islands. This grouping of islands is so small, the land area is only 172 square kilometers, or 66 square miles. That's about the size of Irvine, California, or St. Louis, Missouri. And until the mid-19th century, these 11 tropical islands were the only source of nutmeg in the world. You can thank the spice trade of the 16th century for bringing it into your kitchen. Actually, get ready to thank the spice trade for a lot. In the 15th century, spice was kind of a big deal. Italy and the Byzantine Empire had a stronghold over trade routes with the East. But in 1453, this guy, Mehmed II, aka Mehmed the Conqueror, aka the father of conquest, well, I bet you can guess what he did. He took Constantinople, and as a result, the Ottomans had full control of the spice trade and began levying heavy taxes on everybody. So the Western Europeans were like, not cool, man, and started looking for a way to circumvent these goons. Portugal took to dominating the seas and sailed around the southern tip of Africa for the first time by the late 15th century. Portugal's neighbor and rival, Spain, technically still the crown of Castile, was not happy about this, so they were ready to figure out their own way to the Indies. You might recognize this as about the time when a guy named Chris wanted to sail the ocean blue. So, we're firmly in the age of discovery. Castile is busy spreading smallpox over here. Thanks, spice trade but Portugal is still on track building ports all over India and nearby islands. In 1511, they attempted to take this small city, Malacca. To the Portuguese, Malacca was vitally important because, in the words of Alfonso de Albuquerque, by taking Malacca, we would close the straits so that never again would the Muslims be able to bring their spices by this route. I am very sure that if this Malacca trade is taken out of their hands, Cairo and Mecca will be completely lost. Malacca served as the center to Asian trade and was a gateway to the East Indies, and the Portuguese were out for blood. The Moroccan ruler, Sultan Mahmud Shah, wasn't about to take an attack lying down. He amassed 20,000 men, and they were ready to take on Portugal's 1,200. You can probably predict how this turned out, and you'd be wrong. War isn't just a numbers game, and Mahmud's army was so thoroughly unprepared that they managed to kill only 28 Portuguese, mostly by way of poison arrows. It's unknown how many Moroccans died in these attacks, but the number is probably more than 28. So great, the Portuguese slaughtered a bunch of people and got their nutmeg monopoly. Except they didn't. They had gotten help from the Chinese to siege Malacca, but like the dummies they were, they betrayed the Chinese and also made a few more enemies along the way. The Sultanate of Ternate was in power all over the Banda Sea, and of course wanted more power. But like Thanos, Portuguese didn't really like the idea of sharing. Another war ensued, and the Portuguese were like, ugh, again? Luckily for them, by this time Spain had made their own place in the world. No, not there. Here. The two countries set aside their differences, and like Amazon warehouse workers, they needed to unionize. This worked for the Portuguese, by which I mean it didn't work very well at all. They were never able to develop a foothold in the Spice Islands because of other sultanates in the area. The final blow that drove the nasty Iberians from the Banda Sea was the intervention of the Dutch, who were ready to take over the spice trade. Okay, quick sidebar. I've been calling these the Spice Islands and the East Indies. The actual name for these islands is the Maluku Islands. And now that we're done talking about Malacca, I'm feeling good about switching to the proper name now. Anyway, in 1599, the Dutch made contact with the Banda Islands and signed a lucrative deal with the chieftains to establish a trading post. Soon after, in 1602, the Dutch formed the Dutch East India Company, also called the VOC for reasons I will not try to pronounce. 
The VOC went back to the Banda Islands in 1609 and wanted to establish a monopoly on the spice trade. But the Bandanese were like, no, no, let's just go with the highest bidder. Free trade is good for everyone, you know? The Dutch were acting very Portuguese, so the chieftains on the island of Bandanera said, hey, we're on a nice tropical island. Let's take our negotiations out to the beach. And the commanding Dutch officer, a man named Peter Willems Verhoff, followed them. Let's get some shade in the jungle. Well, sure, why not? So Verhoff and a bunch of his men walked off and lived the rest of their lives in the jungle. Unfortunately for them, the rest of their lives was a few short minutes, because all four dozen of them had walked into an ambush and were quickly killed off. The VOC retaliated bigly, and a couple months after that, the Bandanese signed a treaty that said, Yeah, sure, you're the exclusive trader. Just please stop plundering our villages and killing our people. Unbeknownst to the VOC, the Bandanese had their fingers crossed the entire time and were selling their nutmeg and mace to the English, the Malay, the Javanese, and the Macassarese for way more money. The VOC was clearly not happy about this. So by 1614, they decided the best thing to do was conquer the entirety of the Banda Islands and slaughter anyone that came in their way. The Dutch attacked the island of Ai, and the English in the area retreated to the island of Roon before regrouping and striking back, killing 200 Dutchmen. The Bandanese, not wanting to face another retaliatory attack, sent a letter to the English to ask for protection, saying, All of us of the islands of Banda do utterly hate the sight of these Hollanders, sons of whores, because they exceed in lying and villainy and desire to overcome all men's country by treachery. Them's fighting words, my friends. The letter concludes, help us because you like us, but also we'll sell all our spices to you and only you. No fingies crossed this time. And the English agreed. The English established a fortress on the island of Rune, and the Dutch proceeded to attack it for four years before it fell. And just like your crazy ex, the VOC kept checking in on the island for years to make sure that the Bandanese weren't still secretly in cahoots with the English. The English and Dutch were in an all-out war over the Maluku Islands, but back in Europe, the story was entirely different. At the same time, the Dutch and English unified in their Protestant religion to stand against the Catholic Portuguese and Spanish. Back in the Netherlands, the governing board of the VOC sent a letter to their governor general, Jan Peterson Kuhn, out in Maluku, and essentially told him to knock it off and make friends. The English would receive one-third of the spices, and the Dutch would retain the remaining two-thirds. Kuhn wrote back to his bosses and called them dumb, saying he was going to take matters into his own hands and finish the job. In response, the board was like, fine, whatever, do what you gotta do. So in March 1621, Kuhn and over 2,000 men attacked the main Banda island of Lontor. Dozens of Bandanese were killed in the first day. The English barely suffered any casualties. The Bandanese surrendered immediately and gave the Dutch everything they wanted. And in return, they were allowed personal freedom, autonomy, and the right to continue practicing Islam. And here you thought this war was only about spice. Meanwhile, most of the islanders had fled and went into hiding, attacking any Dutch invaders that found them out. Once again, Kuhn was not cool with his men randomly dying. So he ordered villages to be razed, inhabitants to be tortured and enslaved, and Bandanese elites called Orangkaya to be executed. All this still didn't scare the natives into surrendering, many of whom decided to starve to death or kill themselves by jumping off cliffs then turn themselves over to the VOC. In all, about 25 to 2800 Bandanese died in the aftermath of the war, and 1700 were enslaved. A few hundred survivors managed to flee to nearby islands, but the population had been decimated. What had been about 15,000 Bandanese and foreign spice traders from the area now numbered only 1,000. Thanks, spice trade. And because of the now tiny Bandanese population, the VOC was forced to repopulate the islands with slaves and convicts, and hundreds of original Bandanese were brought back for their expertise in nutmeg harvesting, thereby teaching the Dutch that you really do reap what you sow. By 1681, the Bandanese population was down to 100, and the new population under the rule of Dutch colonialism was forced to convert to the Dutch sect of Christianity. Over 100 years later, there was one final invasion of the Banda Islands. By the early 1800s, the Netherlands had been at war with England, which ended disastrously for the Dutch. They ultimately allied themselves with the French and became a vassal state under them. During this time, 
France was under the rule of a guy with a huge Napoleon complex, so they were super busy conquering all over Europe. The English saw this as an opportune time to take back the Spice Islands, so in 1809, they launched their attack and managed to overcome the Dutch forces. For a few short years, the English exported nutmeg trees to other British colonies, which meant that for the first time ever, nutmeg was grown outside of the Banda Islands. It also meant that Banda became essentially worthless to the Dutch, and they'd never be able to regain their monopoly. So, with the Anglo-Dutch Treaty signed in 1814, Banda was returned to the Dutch and remained in their possession until Indonesia's independence in 1949. And that's it. That's the story of how the seed of a tropical fruit ignited wars led to the massacre of a native population who were the only people in the world who knew how to grow that fruit and how it ended up in your cookies, cakes, and drinks. Thanks, Spice Trade. Thank you for falling down that rabbit hole with me. One little tidbit I couldn't quite fit in there was that in the mid-1600s, Rune was claimed and occupied by the British. There was a back and forth between British and Dutch forces for a few years before the Treaty of Breda was signed in 1667. It outlined the exchange of Rune back to the VOC and the British would get New Amsterdam, what's known today as the island of Manhattan. The Dutch literally traded away New York so they could have a monopoly on nutmeg. Anyway, this topic was really interesting to research and write about. So I want to thank my Patreon patrons for their continued support that lets me make these videos. If you're feeling awesome, give that Patreon a visit. Otherwise, a like, share, and subscribe would also be cool. We'll see you next time.